Yo, what up, y'all? It's your boy RTR Movie Man, and we back with another episode of the Elephant in the Room podcast. And I don't have to explain to y'all what just happened this weekend, as especially on this past Sunday. If you follow ba- Alabama basketball, you know Bama versus UNC for overtime dub. Let's get into it. No further ado. And right off the bat, y'all, when this game started, for me personally, it was like a typical Alabama game or basically how they've been starting in the past couple games in the PK-85 tournament where it's very defensive oriented, not too much scoring to start off the game, but they were still able to get their offense going somewhat. Uh, Plays were being run, plays were being executed well. And it was kind of a back and forth, but really kind of felt like Bama was in good control until the 14 minute mark in the first half when suddenly the offensive offense just got cold. And it was as soon as they subbed in this lineup where they had JQ at the one, Bradley at the two, Gurley at the four and Pringle at the five. I forget who was at the three, but this, this little, uh, this lineup right here, uh, was what sparked like a 7-0 or 9-0 run for UNC. And they meet, and uh, NATO immediately made adjustments, adjustments after like two minutes because uh, it was not looking good on this lineup for some reason. Uh, JQ had had a kind of rough, rough start coming out. And then just Bradley, Pringle just weren't really doing much off, off the ball and stuff. So... Uh, that had to get stopped, and and then once uh, the adjustments were made, uh, JQ did start getting going. He was able to hit a couple shots, like he hit a flo- he hit a floater, he hit a three. Uh, uh, the ball was moving around more. Sears, who throughout the first half and and throughout regulation was really hitting his threes, especially in the first half. Uh, JQ was getting some penetration and had a few kickouts to him. Uh, some nice defensive plays, but Brandon Miller throughout this first half was not looking good and really throughout the game. And I'm going to get more into like 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 uh, how the players did individually it's right after I go through this because I just want to get through the game flow first. But after that, I'm going to go more into these players. But Brandon Miller did not have the did not have a Brandon Miller game by no means, but in terms of what I thought about the first half, it was still pretty nice defense, pretty pretty good. Offense was uh pretty was pretty solid too. They were able to recover after that after that stretch with the in around the fourteen minute mark, and uh, yeah. I'm, I didn't. I don't really have too much to say on, on it. Uh, we were executing our our sets like we should, but we also started to uh, rely on like some guard penetration from Sears and JQ. But overall, even though Bama was struggling, UNC was still having to hit quite a few difficult shots that kept them in the game because their offensive plan had been awful and Bama was just locking it all up. When at the end of the first half, they had a 37-34 lead. And uh, to give them credit, though, Leaky Black, who is one of the best defenders in college basketball, p- played some great defense on Brandon Miller, and they were good at bringing on double teams on him. As for as for the, those double teams, they really started off early, and and what they and it would be like a very aggressive uh, help double team kind of trap. As soon as Miller got the ball, and you could see Miller. He would recognize it before the guy would come, but then he would kind of hesitate because he doesn't quite have the the handles to to really just get by or get out of it. And not to mention, his passing is not bad or anything, but it's not elite. So you saw him just kind of struggle with that, and uh, you know, kind of took him out the game. And once he once he got caught in those traps, he would have to like pivot around and get it to an open teammate or whatnot. So. You could tell after you could tell after they were setting some of those traps that it did take Miller off of his rhythm, and throughout the game he just couldn't get it going. So, so that was what really affected us in the first half. Second half, uh, we saw we did see Miller hit a step back three, but that was about it. Uh, Betty Yako had a good block on Baycott, which by the way, 
Betty Ako played a lot of good defense on him in the first half, but at near, near the beginning of the second half, UNC went on another run, and they were just giving it to Baycott, and they were just feeding him down in the post. Uh, Betty Yako got a got had a couple plays where Baycott was just was just pushing him down, even if Baycott was in like the mid post region, he would just kind of bully Betty Yako and he would hit him two three times with his shoulder, just just taking him to the rim and then just getting an end one or whatnot. Uh, they did sub in Nick Pringle for like a minute, and they did the same thing again, but Pringle literally hooked Baycott because he couldn't like keep in front of him. And then Oates was like, nope, you're done. We're just going to put Pediaco back in. So that happened. That happened. But uh, JQ, JQ really willed this team because offensively, uh, we were not able to get much going through our through our sets. The UNC defender is really good with just trailing, with not trailing our the Bama, defend, Bama players on offense and just keeping up with them, staying in front. And really just eliminating all of the non-ball handlers. So, especially in overtime. But it really came down to, because of that, as you as you guys should know from watching Bama basketball, Quinterly is really the only guy who can just blow by pretty much anyone. And because he has that talent, uh it started becoming more quinterly basketball, which I'm going to go break down into more after the game flow. But that's that is a very important thing to mention in the game flow, because, again, we did see some bad, bad plays by JQ. There's literally a stretch where he had a turnover off a double team and they started do, doing the same double teaming to both Sears and quinterly, where even when they're bringing up, bringing the ball up the court, they would start trapping like near half court. And they forced a couple turnovers by both of them until Quinterly like recognized it. And there was one play he recognized it. He passed it to a guy on on the wing, and then that guy passed it to Bediaco, just open underneath the rim for an easy easy bucket. So then UNC just stopped that step. So Quinterly did do well adjusting to the traps, and not only that, he was able to. St- get it going because he hit a bunch of good threes he had a bunch of good layups and uh yeah another thing about the second half is we allowed too many offensive rebounds and i get it noah Clowney going down in the first three minutes most certainly affects our rebounding he is a top two rebounder on this team at minimum so not having him really helps but we still had we still had Sears, who is one of the best rebounders, at the point guard position. We had Miller, we had Bediaco, and it, and it was to the point where it's like, why aren't you do? Why aren't you able to secure the rebounds? Now some of them was because they the big would literally just not block out Baycott, and there were a couple of times where I'm like, Raj, like Bediaco, why aren't you blocking him out? And the, out of all people, uh, I'm forgetting his name, the old dude who was making horrible commentary, Bill Walton. Out of all people, he made an observation and said, well, in the first half, they had Baycock kind of standing standing near the three-point line when they, were taking lo- when they were taking shots. But in the second half, they just had him just sitting around the rim, which put him in position to make rebounds, which... Which was true, by the way. I I did think about some of those plays, and I was like, oh yeah, he he is right for once, even though he's been horrible at commentating. Commentating, but that's a Bill Walton is a different story. So there were a couple plays where Betty Yako didn't break it, didn't block out in this stretch, and uh, also speak also for these offensive rebounds, whether it was. Baycott or someone else. It was mainly Baycott getting the offensive rebounds, but it was either Betty Ako or for or mostly to be honest. He was only a small part. Majority of it was on the guard drives when when Betty Ako had to rotate over and bring help on the drive. Uh we weren't rotating. And this is something that I've kind of mentioned in some of the earlier podcast episodes where we're we as a team Bama 
can be really good at bringing help defense, but then we just don't rotate our players over when we bring out help. Like just the other the other three players on defense will just not do anything. And obviously, in some instances, like if if it's like a big roll into the basket and a pick and roll or something, or you know, just some guy near the basket. Obviously, you can't really rotate over, like especially if you have got, especially if your three other guys are on the wing. But there was a there were a couple rebounds where they had a guy like away from the basket, but he had complete open space and would just run run to the basket and grab an offensive rebound in the stretch. So I think that should have been cleaned up because this again this is too talented of a rebounding team to just allow, be allowing that many offensive rebounds. But they did clean it up after the first part of the second half. So I will give them credit to that. But Bediaco oh, also Bediaco Bediaco also noticed some of this where even if he brought help they would just like they would like pass it to a wide open person for example. And you could you could notice how he became so much better at uh p- just p- putting himself in the proper position where he he doesn't want to get too far away from the basket and allow an, and allow an extra pass for an open layup but like if there was a pick and roll for example he would he would come up and stand not at the not at the free throw line but like halfway but halfway up to the free throw line so he'll be far he'll be close enough to contest the open mid m- mid-ranger so that it wouldn't so that it wouldn't go in but also if an extra bounce pass was made or whatnot, he could be able to rotate over and still contest the shot. Betty Yako's presence was very on the defensive end, became more and more felt. After he kind of struggled a little bit in the second half, he completely turned it on. And uh and yeah, like in terms of that, uh yeah, like I don't I don't I don't know what else I can say about the second half there, but uh that's that's really the, all the Oh so my bad, I'm sorry for stumbling, but in terms of uh game flow, at the end of the game we did get bailed out by Caleb Love taking like a very crazy off balance three, which was missed very badly, but on the final possession, I I didn't have a problem with JQ getting the ball and trying to just create for himself on the final possession because like literally like every NBA team does that. They put it in their in their uh, playmakers' hands. He's the only one that was able to create the whole game, really, on offense. So I didn't have a problem. But if you were gonna do that, why did they like? Why did they keep both Charles and Brandon Miller both on each side on the opposite side on the opposite ends of each junction, bro? Because you could because they did try to set a screen, but after that they kind of just when after that they kind of just like stood around or try to get out the way, but it was like the spacing wasn't quite the best. Personally, I would have preferred don't even try, don't even worry about getting JQ a screen. Just puts put small guys or just just spread out the court f- all five out and try to get JQ to do something personally but it is what it is um so yeah it became overtime and up to this point I was like the three point shooting was really what kept us in this game we hit like I don't know I want to say we hit 13 threes in the first half but uh, I might be wrong. We finished with sixteen threes to end the game. But I remember at one point we were, we were thirteen of twenty six, but we finished sixteen of thirty eight. So it kind of dipped. But that's that's besides the, that's besides the point. Uh, but uh, we we relied on that and just JQ trying to create the whole offense. And one of my uh critiques was even though, even though our sets weren't quite going and we were having to rely on JQ. One of my critiques was we should at least try to get some sets going in the second half, even if it resulted in three or four, uh, you know, missed, missed shots or just not eaten or just like weren't executed properly because 
even if we had three or four bad possessions, we could just uh, make we could just make some adjustments or whatever, and just just try to get it going is what I'm saying. Even if even if we didn't quite execute in the short term and the long term, just trying to get the guys to keep moving their feet. So that we could keep creating opportunities instead of just slowly rely on JQ. Because as soon as the overtime started, JQ struggled. He was getting blocked. He was creating turnovers. And it was not looking good. But uh, we did ha we did have a few things go our way. Now, w one of those things was UNC was also fumbling the bag. Like both, well, I won't say fumbling the bag, but you know what I'm saying. They were both, both teams just were messing up big time, especially on the offense. It became a really sloppy game in the overtimes. But uh, JQ did have a couple good uh, uh, interceptions in terms of like he would just predict where the ball was going and he would just run in front of the pass and just intercept the ball. But uh, yeah, just bad, just bad offense. Uh, Def defense was really prevailing and it was still just J give JQ the ball and see what happens and then second overtime happened where right out right out of the gate we saw a great hand handoff action where Betty Yako gave it to JQ and then he turned around and, and ran to it ran to the rim and then JQ on the drive was able to bounce it into Betty Yako for a score and I was like okay okay good get some offense going but it it didn't uh, it didn't really happen. Uh, you, this is where we saw that JQ and Sears are really getting tired uh, because they were losing their footing a lot on defense. We saw JQ both Sears and JQ stumble a lot on some of their when they were trying to stay in front of their guys and stuff, and it became clear that uh, they were just they just kept trying to attack them because uh, they were just worn out and. And uh, there was also one play here where, where they had a screen, and uh, I want to say Sears got caught in the screen, and there was like a wide open shooter, but Noah Gurley was able to see that happen, like, like he was able to just see that happen very quickly and go run out to the shooter before he could take an open shot and contest it, and I'm bringing this up because throughout this game, in in the second half, he was basically non-existent because it was just heavy. Just give the ball to JQ and see what happens. But Noah Gurley was hitting his was hitting his threes. I believe he went three of five, and he had a couple good drives. But but yeah yeah like uh, in terms of like like getting the offense going, yeah they weren't good at, they weren't good in terms of just trying to get the offense going, running their sets and their handoffs and stuff and whatnot. But still, Noah Gurley seems like a much more uh disciplined player he doesn't really make any mistakes whenever he contest it seems like he knows how to contest on it on near every shot and he just doesn't foul so i just wanted to get put that out there and then uh third overtime started and uh betty Aka wasn't in the here and uh immediately uh unc got three easy drives and then went to the free throw line, and they had to put Bediaco back in. And then suddenly they couldn't get anything going towards the rim, and they were settling for leaky black, sh leaky black shots to end the third overtime. And that helped Bama come back in and tie it. And then fourth overtime, uh, I I was starting to think that the depth helped us. Now I'm going to talk about the depth more soon, but really this is where. Betty Aka, who by the way was absolutely shining in the in these in all of these overtimes and the second half after he got subbed out at the point where I, when I told you when Baycott was just bullying him down low he was literally blocking all Baycott he was blocking contesting Baycott sh shots and everyone's shots he was making the 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 right rotations helping at the at the right moments positioning himself in case if he had to spy on another on another player but also wanted to help make sure he can bring help in time to a, a ball handler for example and he really put on a show and i want to say in second or third overtime he had like this baseline drive where he spun 
on Baycott and then just took it to the rim. And I'm just like, damn. When when Chuck gets angry, he really turns it on to another level. And and, to the, and near the end, to end the game, uh, JQ literally threw up an alley-oop to him for a dunk. And I'm like, thank God, man. You got to get it to the playmaker's hands. So, yeah, Betty Yako, you not only was he able to defend well and contest well, he started putting his body into Baycott and was rebounding on him. He was blocking out. He was rebounding on everyone. And let me just say, Bama ended up finishing with a four rebound lead. And even though even though I said like halfway through the second half on around halfway through, UNC had a two rebound re- lead. And that was mainly from Charles Bediaco. He finished the game with sixteen rebounds. And especially near the end, he was a one man rebounding machine. Like there was no one else on the team doing that. That so that's why a lot of people have been saying he was the MVP of this game. He got the hard hat award. So, yeah, credit to Chuck because without him, we would not have won this game. Nowhere close. And I also wanted to say, the only player that was keeping it close. I mean, Caleb Love all had a great game too. But he also, had, but with Caleb Love, you know, there's a good, there's the good and bad. He can make a lot of crazy shots, but he can also take and miss a lot of crazy shots. And you never know what you're going to get with Caleb Love. But Baycott, Baycott definitely helped so much to the point where you could see when Baycott was subbed out, how much harder it was for UNC to to stop Bama or how much it was for them to get going. Because, and this this also happened in 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 the fourth overtime where I'm like, why did Baycott just not play for like four minutes? Because I I want I believe that's what really what really uh, lost the game for UNC too, and uh, and again just leaky black shots, having him trying to take shots does not really help the team. So yeah, like that that's really the game, man. In terms of an uh, individual perform. So, well, actually, before I go into vi- visual performance, let me just give my uh, final thoughts. So I'm still scared about playing teams with dominant bigs because and Baycott not playing in these overtimes definitely helped. Uh, that was, this, is, this is a concern I wrote down, though. After talking in the Twitter space, uh, it has been noted that, that Charles Bediaco has stepped up when he's played good bigs like he did against uh, Gonzaga last year, for example. And he did it against the against UNC, even though he really cleaned he really cleaned up and dominated there and helped uh, limit Baycott. So maybe maybe I'm a little overreacting, but it's maybe it's not my biggest concern. But that's what I felt for some stretches of the game, for sure. But it's not quite the biggest concern I have. I loved how he cleaned up the rebounding at the end, but it was still mainly Charles doing it. I don't care if Clowney is out. We're too talented a rebounding team. Yeah, I kind of already mentioned that. Uh, Brandon Miller also needs to be strong in going to the rim. Uh, Christian Sykes mentioned this. Uh, and my what I think w- could help him, I'm not a basketball coach or anything, but just improving his handle will not only improve his drives because even though he had a couple of, the, a couple of his shots blocked, on some of his drives, he would have an, o- an open shot, like an open layup, but... Like a little window, to for like a for him to just lay it up, but then he would miss, and there was a play in overtime where Miller got the rebound and had a wide open shot underneath the basket, but then missed it. So, so I don't know. I, I feel like his I feel like his uh handle is really was limiting to him, limiting him because even on some of his pull ups, you could see when he's struggling to handle the ball, he would then just try to pull up. And then his motion on the pull up would look kind of awkward and clunky, and it's like if he just, if he can just fix his handle, but but more so on the pull up, fix fix how he uh, his abil- his footing, his like his footwork and stuff, he could easily knock down a lot of these shots because he's too talented of a shooter already, and we all know how good of a shooter he is, whether it's mid range or three, so just just working on some footwork drills and. And uh, improving his handle, I think that alone is gonna improve his shooting exponentially because the shooting mechanics is there and the shooting touch is there too. So, 
I think if he can really do that, he would very much solidify that that number three overall spot that some uh, mock drafts are having him at. Uh, I already talked about the double teams. Uh, there was also twice in overtime where Jaden Bradley checked in, and immediately he got like two tough baskets near the rim. And this was really important because his defense, as usual, was stellar, and that really helped uh, help keep keep the offense going, especially when JQ couldn't get anything going. But both times after he made that first basket, as soon as he get in, he would kind of just disappear, or he would just like try the same thing again, but then UNC would just stop it, and then it would be like a really bad miss. So uh, that happened, but still. Just being able to still have him on, have him come in the game really helped because UNC, his depth is not the greatest. And uh, even Bill Walton said this, where uh, it was, really, was that UNC is not as deep of a team as Alabama. And though Even though going back, like uh, Burnett kind of just played himself out the game. Uh, he was not having a good game at all. Pringle only played six minutes. And uh, Griffin, he did he did come in some in the in uh, the overtime. He did have some okay defense here. I'd have to go back and really analyze, but nothing nothing that really stuck out. But he didn't really have a good game, anyways. He did play 16 minutes though, but finished with three points. So that really left us with uh, really seven guy eight seven eight guys playing most of the game which wasn't really which really didn't help so actually seven actually it's more like seven six but yeah yeah but just having Jaden Bradley come and check in did help keep the offense going uh and also why did we leave Sears in the game because I get it he was going off especially in the first half and some in the second half from three but then once we once we went to a Javon Quinterly just iso ball, we weren't able to get the ball to him. And then, like I want to say, in like the fourth overtime, he tried to cri- he tried to take a three, but then he just airballed really bad. And it's like, yeah, he just went cold after going the twenty minutes without shooting a three. So because so that really happened. And Sears also he wasn't able to get much cr- in terms of creation. He wasn't really able to do much. A lot of those threes were created were were on pull-ups or off the catch. So his creation, he really kind of struggled this game and it resulted in turnovers or, you know, just bad shots. He couldn't really be that effective. So those were my main thoughts on the game. I'm, I need to figure out how to make these podcasts shorter and deliver my thoughts better, but I will go into the player analysis now. Is uh, Noah Clowney got hurt. Brandon Miller, he played 48 minutes, and it was a time where it's like, I don't know why you kept Miller in, but like in the fourth overtime, he did make one like good basket, and I think the thing is like, even if he is, he is non-existent in the game, he still puts some pressure on defenses because he's that talented of a player, so just having him in the game instead of like Ryland not doing anything, you'd rather Miller just not doing anything because... You know, you can't just leave the guy open, for example. Like, he can still get it going and hurt you in a way. Uh, Bediaco was clearly the player of the game. Finished with 14 points, 16 rebounds, played 44 minutes. And Mark Sears had the most minutes, 55. And I'm like, again, why did Mark Sears play that much if you were not going to draw plays to get him open? You know, especially in the third and fourth overtime, because by then... You could see both teams were completely gassed, and it made no sense running set plays at that point. You like you had to have run like just more like just simple pick and rolls at the most, like screens, and just try to get you know your best players to get something going. But Nick Pringle, I already talked about him. Noah Gurley, another great another great game, even though. He kind of just disappeared offense, especially offensively and on the in the in the overtimes. He did do his job in uh in OT in in OT and uh again he's been playing great defense. He played solid defense in the overtime. He's really been that veteran the veteran guy who 
is going the cons- the veteran guy the consistency that we need the guy that we we know we can count on even if other guys don't have it going we need that guy and Gurley is now doing that and Jaden Bradley I didn't mention him he finished with 10 points and he also played some phenomenal defense and last but not least Javon Quinterly like yeah he finished he won 8 of 26 3 of 11 from 3 but Without Quinterly, we won't have won this game too. Quinterly and Betty Aka were the two best players, guys. Quinterly had to get the ball because, again, he's the only guy who can break, who can just go by his defender every time. Or well, even though Sears can, he sometimes he may have struggle. He may struggle uh, going by the like getting by the help. And I get it. JQ has the same too. You know, there's the good and the bad that comes with JQ, but you know there's at least good. And in this game in particular, Sears did not, outside of his three-point shooting, did not bring much, did not really bring any good, if I'm going to be honest. So, shout out to JQ. Uh, I will also mention, just because I want to remember this for another video, the reason why that is is because we all know Sears is is stronger and a little more physical than JQ. And if I'm going to be real, he's a better leaper. And once he hits the top speed, he you can argue he's just as fast as JQ. But the difference is JQ's first step and his acceleration just, just has defenses completely collapsing. And you just see it every single game. Just that quick burst of speed he has, that, that, that acceleration he has. Sometimes he'll just blow by the defender so badly. You can see... You can see like the team like the de- like the defense just like panic and having to bring so many guys over to help and then JQ will just have an easy kick out pass to an open shooter. Like I don't like I don't think people realize that enough how just just having that guy with that kind of acceleration and speed brings so much to the table. And we're gonna we will definitely have to keep relying on him throughout the season. So yeah, that's really all my thoughts, guys. This was a long one, but then again, it was a long game, so please don't get mad at me. I'm, I need to start going and looking at these podcasts to see how I can do it better. Maybe I'll type up a script next time, but let me know what you think about it. If you like this video, please press the thumbs up, and if not, then it's cool. Don't press thumbs up, but at least tell me why you didn't. Give, give me some feedback in the comments. Leave a comment below, and uh, also... Go ahead, if you did like this video or are interested, go check out a couple more videos. Because, uh, you know, I, the, I, I'm i going to keep giving out BAM Up content. And there's plenty on the, on the channel right now. So, yeah, please go check it out. And if you do like my videos, uh, just, give, just give it a chance. Go watch a couple more. And if you like them, then subscribe. <coughs> Excuse me. Damn, my throat is gone. But anyways, guys, this is Mooley. Have a good day. Peace.